Thank you very much for everyone, uh, to everyone for joining our first EdNet Memory Clinics webinar in 2022 today. Um, we'll be presenting, or um, our two speakers, Professor Paminda Sechtev and Dr. Matt Paradise, will be speaking on the topic of vascular cognitive disorders today. I would like to start with an acknowledgement to country today. The Australian Dementia Network acknowledges the traditional custodians of country where we're meeting to, on, on today throughout Australia. We recognise the continuing connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to all of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their cultures and their elders past, present and emerging. I think most of you who joined today probably heard a bit about the Australian Dementia Network already, um, as well as about the Memory Clinics Initiative. So we are not going into much detail about that today, but we would like to alert you that there are other projects going on within EdNet um, that you might be interested in. For example, have you considered signing up your clinic for the EdNet registry already? If not, and you're interested in, please get in touch with the registry team via the email below. Um, and if you haven't joined our EdNet Memory Clinics or Memory and Cognition Clinic locator yet, please get in touch with our team and we would be more than happy to join you to our locator that currently consists of more than 135 entries. Starting with the webinar housekeeping for today. So if you experience any technical difficulties, please use the raise your hand function here on the webinar and the moderators will try to help you immediately. If you have any questions about the presentations at any point, please put them in the Q&A below. Um, write your questions and at the end of the presentations, we will come back to the questions and discuss them together with the presenters. Any other queries can also be put in the chat and the moderators will respond to all of those queries. All right, so coming to the main event today, our two speakers today are Professor Paminda Sechtev and Dr. Matt Paradise. Professor Paminda Sechtev is a Scienti Professor for Neuropsychiatry and the co-director of CHIBA at, the, at UNSW as well as the clinical director of the Neuropsychiatric Institute at the Prince of Wales Hospital. He's also the deputy director of ADNET and co-leads the Memory Clinics Initiative. In 2021, Paminda established the Center for Research Excellence in Vascular Contributions to Dementia. Our second speaker today, Dr. Matt Paradise, is an old age psychiatrist and early career researcher at Chiba. Matt has trained both in the UK and Australia, receiving a Master's of Psychiatric Research from the University College of London. He has recently completed his PhD in Vascular Cognitive Impairment and Neuroimaging at Chiba, where his thesis received the Dean's Award for Outstanding PhD Theses. So highly qualified speakers for you today lined up, and I would like to um, welcome Faminda Sechtuf now to start with the webinar for today. So good afternoon and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to you on vascular cognitive disorders. Today, what I'm going to do is look at some of the key challenges in this field as I see them. And I generally start off by talking about a brief history of uh, terminology because I think there is a lot of confusion about terms in this field. In fact, we go back 70 years and we see the term chronic brain syndrome being used in relation to chronic cerebrovascular disease. In fact, it was called cardiovascular disease generally at that time. And then actually in the early 70s, when Hachinsky published his paper uh, on vascular dementia and said that vascular dementia was largely multi-infarct dementia, accumulation of infarcts in the brain. And for nearly two decades after that, the concept of vascular dementia was largely synonymous with multi dementia. And then uh, we started seeing some work being presented on small vessel disease and dementia and subcortical dementia. In fact, the paper in 1985 talked about Binswanger's disease as a small vessel dementia. It was considered to be a rare disorder at that time. And then there was talk about cortical and subcortical dementias. 
And then in the early 90s is when the first criteria for vascular dementia were published uh, from the California group in 92 and uh, the nins Aaron criteria uh, uh, by Roman and colleagues in 1993. And these criteria, especially the nins Aaron criteria, have been used largely over the last uh, three decades in many trials, as well as a number of other studies. Now, at the same time, see, around uh, in the mid 90s, uh, there was increasing recognition of the fact that, yes, when we talked about vascular dementia, we were talking only about the tip of the iceberg, and that vascular cognitive impairment actually referred to a spectrum of brain pathologies. Uh, and therefore, we should be talking about vascular cognitive impairment as a continuum. In fact, this term VCI has caught on uh, quite a bit um, and is still being used uh, uh, in many circles. Uh, then I introduced the uh, term vascular cognitive disorder in harmony with DSM terminology in 2004. And in 2014, we published the criteria, the VASCOG criteria for vascular cognitive disorders as a, as a group from the VASCOG Society. Uh, in 2018, another set of criteria uh, was published uh, by this group, the VIX group. Essentially, it was a Delphi consensus of experts around the world. And in fact, when you actually look at the criteria, they look very similar to the VASCOG criteria. And then there was a group in 2018 in the United States uh, by the NIH and the American Heart Association which looked at the literature again, and they came up with a set of criteria as well, along with the another extensive literature. And they tended to call this group of disorders vascular cognitive impairment and dementia, so VCID. So you see that in, in North America, VCID is a commonly used term. Now, if you look at the four commonly used criteria up until recently, the nins Aaron, the ADTC, which is the California criteria, DSM-4 and ICD-10, and see how well do they perform vis-a-vis -vis each other. Uh, and you see, look at their concordance. You find that there is actually very variable concordance between the different criteria. And sometimes the concordance is maybe as low as one in three uh, patients being concordant. And if you actually look at, say, a set of uh, patients who meet some criteria for vascular dementia and will apply them to different criteria, you find that only about one in three, or even less than that, met all criteria for vascular dementia. So you can see that there was a considerable variability between these criteria. And depending on which criteria you used, you came up with different results. And that has actually befuddled the literature considerably. And the, the differences were because of various factors, the neurological signs, uh, cortical functions in terms of asymmetry, and whether imaging was necessary and what kind of imaging was necessary for a diagnosis. So actually going forward then to uh, the noughties and looking at the more recent criteria, the three sets of criteria, the VASCO criteria, the DSM-5 criteria, and the VIX criteria, we find that there is a lot of similarity. Essentially what they're looking at is these four uh, aspects, uh, whether the patient has a complaint of decline or informant has a complaint of decline, whether there is cognitive impairment to a certain degree, and usually a cutoff is used, say, uh, below the uh, below 1.5 percentile or 2 percentile, depending on which category you're using, whether there is a disturbance of instrumental activities of daily living, so the individual loses independence of functioning, and whether there is predominant vascular etiology that can explain this cognitive impairment. And of course, there are subtle differences between these criteria, but not huge differences. And some of the differences are in what kind of evidence is enough. And in fact, VASCO criteria go to greater length in trying to explain and trying to uh, give guidance as to what criteria, uh, what imaging uh, and other biomarker evidence may be enough to diagnose vascular pathology. But overall, when you actually compare these, and we tried to compare these criteria with the previous criteria, we found that these criteria were quite concordant with each other. The, the three VASCOG, DSM-5, and VIX, but they had relatively low concordance with the previous criteria. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, I can't go into all the reasons today, but uh, one of the things that, of course, I'll come to that in a moment uh, in terms of the definition of dementia itself, but I also should mention in passing the Hachinsky ischemic score, which many of you are familiar with, and which has been used uh, over several decades now 
this was essentially, this came from the 1974 paper by Hachinsky and essentially was distinguishing multi-infarct dementia from Alzheimer's disease, not our broader concept of vascular dementia or vascular cognitive impairment and dementia. Uh, and uh, it's not really something that is very popular anymore, although still there are settings where it is applied. Now, one of the aspects of uh, the differences between different criteria was how dementia was defined. And one of the aspects of that has been that some criteria still required significant memory impairment as being necessary for a diagnosis of dementia, irrespective of what the etiology was. And this is one paper we published in 1999, which actually looked at all the literature and we came to the conclusion that some of the early disturbance in vascular cognitive disorders was in information processing speed and executive function rather than in memory. And even when memory was impaired, it was not the kind of memory impairment that you see in Alzheimer's disease in terms of rapid forgetting, but rather retrieval of information that was uh, more problematic. And I think that uh, uh, change when the, uh, dementia di the dementia diagnosis criteria changed, DSM-5, as well as some of the other criteria, and that actually broadened the field to include more vascular dementia. But also we acknowledge that there is great heterogeneity in the cognitive do uh, domains affected in vascular cognitive impairment. And one of the reasons for that is the varying pathology that underlies uh, VCI. -D. And uh, if you look at the range of pathological lesions that I list here, atherosclerosis, various kinds of small vessel disease, various kinds of parenchymal abnormalities, large and small hemorrhages, uh, changes in the white matter of various kinds, and then ischemic changes which will lead to hippocampal sclerosis and even atrophy. Uh, and then of course, mixed pathology. So this, and because these lesions can happen anywhere in the brain, you can expect that you will see a, a whole range of uh, uh, symptomatology as a result. Now, people have tried to put together uh, the neuropathology underlying vascular dementia. And this is one effort by the Newcastle uh, upon Tyne in the UK group in trying to uh, develop a, an index uh, or a rating scale for neuropathology, looking at these five pathologies. You'll notice that these are largely uh, subcortical uh, or small vessel disease kind of pathologies. Uh, they're not including large vessel disease here in this. Uh, somehow, uh, I mean, even though this is used in certain settings, there is really no consensus on an index which is comprehensive enough for all cerebrovascular disease. And this is still a work in progress. Now, there are some questions uh, often asked, okay? One question asked is, okay, if someone has carotid artery occlusion, say, or stenosis, uh, what, how does that relate to, uh, say, handicap, function, cognition. And there are not many studies that have looked at this, but this study looked at the degree of uh, internal carotid artery stenosis and handicap on a handicap scale. And you can see here in red is minor, uh, is minor symptoms. And then uh, you see here in orange, minor handicap. And you can see that when a person has severe internal carot carotid artery stenosis, there is significant moderate handicap, uh, significant minor handicap and some degree of moderate handicap in individuals. So there is some relationship, but it's not really uh, very it's a good uh, kind of correspondence that you see. But certainly uh, there is there's some suggestion that something is happening if uh, the carot carotid artery is getting occluded. Now, the other question asked, and that is really, I think, because uh, coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease has often been conflated in the literature. And people often talk about cardiovascular risk factor for vascular dementia. So what is the relationship between coronary artery pathology and cerebrovascular pathology? And here, I think the short answer is that, yes, there is a relationship, but it's not uh, a very strong correlation. So it's a uh, correlation of 0.34 in this study uh, between coronary artery stenosis and internal carotid artery stenosis. In fact, when you looked at patients post-stroke who had dementia and those who did not have dementia, the coronary artery stenosis did not differentiate the two. Certainly, 
the carotid artery stenosis uh, uh, pro uh, did have uh, some relationship, although they really did not uh, differentiate between those who did have several infarcts and those who did not have several infarcts either. Now, the other of question that often comes up in the literature is okay in terms of hippocampal atrophy. Certainly, hippocampal sclerosis has been looked at, and certainly with, with hippocampal sclerosis, there are a number of pathologies associated, as, as you know, with TDP43 and uh, uh, being often present, but also vascular pathology causing hippocampal sclerosis. But if you just see atrophy in the hippocampus, uh, is it always Alzheimer's disease? And this is, I think, a popular misconception as well. Because when you look at vascular cases, with pure vascular, without Alzheimer's pathology, you still see significant hippocampal atrophy and overall some brain atrophy as well. And here is uh, hippocampal neuronal counts in individuals with Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, mixed dementia. And you can see that there is in the CA1 region, that's in the dark blue, uh, there is a reduction in hippocampal numbers in both Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. And mixed dementia is even greater. Yeah. And in fact, uh, you could not really distinguish the two. This is not, this difference between AD and VAD is not uh, significant. So uh, I think what uh, the story is that, yes, you can see in pure vascular dementia, you can see hippocampal uh, atrophy as well. And this actually, uh, this is again, a study from the UK, but there was a Californian study, early pathology study that came, for, came to the same conclusion that uh, this, this is probably uh, not a very good uh, discriminating feature between AD and VAD necessarily. Now, the other issue that often comes up uh, in uh, vascular dementia research, and I, see, I can, I'm just picking up a few things because, uh, because of a shortage of time, uh, that uh, the issue of uh, impairment of uh, blood-brain barrier. And uh, this has been often uh, said that, look, in vascular dementia, uh, some of the disturbance is possibly due to breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and uh, of course, blood-brain barrier breakdown also occurs in Alzheimer's disease, but is that more of a significant factor in uh, pathology that has been produced in vascular dementia? So when we talk about the blood-brain barrier, often our focus is on uh, this neurovascular unit, uh, where you have, say, the capillary with the endothelium and then pericyte that puts put pods of the astrocytes around it. So this, this is often the core feature of the neurovascular unit uh, for the neurovascular coupling. And often disturbance in blood brain barrier is either due to endothelial damage or pericyte uh, cell damage. And this study looked at the pericytes in the frontal white matter in uh, patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, 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 vascular dementia and mixed dementia that came to autopsy. And they, they basically looked at markers of uh, pericytes. Uh, and they, they actually, when you look at the number of pericytes here, you find that yes, vascular dementia did have a lower number of uh, uh, pericytes uh, here than maybe perhaps to some degree than uh, then uh, vascular dementia, sorry, I went uh, into wrong mode. Then, then Alzheimer's disease, but but the, uh, but the, it was reduced in uh, Alzheimer's disease as well compared to controls. Uh, and of course, uh, in, it was intermediate in mixed dementia. So certainly parasite loss and breakdown of the blood-brain barrier is, is a significant feature of vascular dementia cases. It occurs in both post-stroke dementia as well as uh, vascular dementia, which is uh, not post-stroke and often uh, mediated by small vessel disease. And uh, there was increase in fibrinogen, uh, suggesting that, yes, this was not just uh, the pericyte loss had resulted in a breakdown of blood brain barrier. So I think this has been, uh, again, suggesting that, yes, blood brain barrier uh, dysfunction is important, uh, possibly important, but it's not exclusive to uh, vascular disorders, it occurs also in neurodegenerative disease. Now, the question then arises is, okay, when we see patients, uh, of course, we know that when older patients come to autopsy, they have multiple pathologies. And uh, in fact, uh, several uh, hundred combinations of pathologies have been described uh, in this. Uh, 
But when we actually try to do, say, do regression analyses and try to see what, how much of the variance of uh, cognition or cognitive decline prior to death is explained by different pathologies. And this is actually probably one of the best studies where they had over a thousand brains uh, from the Rush Memory Project in the religious order studies out there where all these uh, participants actually had enrolled with view to giving their brains for autopsy. So this is as representative a population-based study as you can get in autopsy studies. And you, they found that the total variance explained by the different pathologies that they me measured in the brains was only about 43%. In fact, 57% of the cognitive decline could not be explained by the measurable the pathologies that I think 11 different pathologies that they measured. AD explained about 30 to 36 percent, and non AD pathologies like Lewy body or TDP 43, about 44 4 to 10 percent, and cerebral vascular disease 3 to 8 uh, percent. This gives you some idea of the contribution, but I think also must remember that cerebral vascular disease, again, there were some indices that were measured. But to measure cerebral vascular disease in totality is something very difficult. And it's, I think, often underestimated because like Marlon Paller, for example, is not often included in these. And often uh, they go by atherosclerosis and arteriosclerosis rather than actual measurement of uh, infarction and sub-infarct regions. So I think it could well be an underestimate. And the other issue that often uh, becomes problematic in these cases is that often they do not look at microinfarcts. And in fact, this is one study, this is also a population-based sample, uh, but it's much smaller. And they looked at uh, various uh, indices to see how much uh, would they uh, matter or in terms of the prediction of dementia at death. And if you look at the CDAT score, you found that having frequent plaques did not really increase the odds of having had dementia at death, certainly having block stage five and six increased at six fold. So this was really uh, quite important uh, as a marker. But you look at micro, several microinfarcts. If you have two or more or more than two infarcts, uh, you had, in fact, a five-fold increase likelihood of having, of having died with dementia. And in fact, it was more important than having had cystic infarcts. Uh, so having two or more cystic infarcts, you had a two and a half fold increase in risk. Uh, so I think that's also suggests to you that yes, this is, uh, uh, we may be underestimating, uh, in, the, in our neuropathologies, we may be underestimating the contribution of cerebral vascular disease, but still, uh, even with this data, we, it is a very significant contributor. And then from the neuropathologies, there uh, some uh, subtypes of uh, vascular cognitive disorders have been described. The ones with large infarcts, often something like a multi-infarct dementia, with small infarcts or microinfarcts, often small vessel disease as being the major factor here. Strategically placed infarcts like the thalamus, or the hippocampus, or basal core brain, which can sometimes a single large infarct can cause uh, dementia like picture. Chronic cerebral uh, hyperperfusion leading to hippocampal cirrhosis, cerebral hemorrhage, and these could be large hemorrhages and sometimes uh, multiple cortical uh, ble microbleeds. And then uh, you have uh, mixed pathology. And uh, this is parallel in the clinical classification also with, of VCI or VCID, you can call it, with mild being VCI and major being uh, vascular dementia. Uh, and vascular dementia, you can talk about post stroke dementia, you can talk about subcortical, uh, the small vessel disease kind of dementia, you can talk about multi infarct uh, dementia generally talk about mixed defense dementia. So there's different ways in which people have labeled them in terms of subcategories. But I think to understand neuropathology, then you understand, and you look at the picture and then you can come up with a reasonable uh, kind of uh, overall uh, diagnostic formulation of this group. So coming quite quickly to how common then is vascular dementia? And uh, there are various estimates, but one estimate is that if you look at all cases of dementia, about 15 to 30 percent are largely vascular in origin. Uh, but vascular contributions uh, are in about 50 to 70 percent of cases. And I think you should remember that uh, especially most people with dementia uh, develop dementia in the 80s and 90s. Uh, 
And in fact, that age vaster contribution is very, very common. Uh, uh, and this, this actually, this data is from the NAP database, which is all those IMA centers in uh, America contributing to neuropathology. And post-stroke post cases, uh, we've looked at this very closely and about 20, 25% of patients uh, uh, can be diagnosed with dementia about three to six months after stroke. And majority of these, 75% are predominantly vascular etiologies. Now, when you actually look at autopsy series, you find the rates presented are very varied of how many of these are vascular dementia. You can see so very, and you look at pure vascular dementia. Again, you see it's very varied. So I think these autopsy series, because they're not representative, they vary dep depending on the criteria uh, of a center and the particular interest in research, you get very biased figures. Now, the other question that often is asked, and in fact, some people say, oh, there is no such thing as a uh, true, uh, that vascular dementia, that they are all uh, mixed Alzheimer's disease. So this group looked at what were diagnosed as uh, subcortical, uh, subcortical vascular dementia, largely small vessel disease related dementia, and did amyloid imaging on them. And they found that, in fact, uh, only 30% or so had were PIB positive. So that you have 70%, in fact, were purely subcortical vascular dementia. So that it's not true that uh, subcortical vascular dementia does not exist. So let me just uh, see if I can move, yeah. I actually wanted to talk about, there's so much written on white matter hyperintensities and there are so many uh, different uh, stories around this that one can talk about, but let me not do this because I think Matt uh, is going to talk a little bit about it, but I just wanted to mention that we looked at the heritability of white matter lesions and found that the heritability was actually over 0.7. Uh, so that over 70% of the variance in white matter volumes in, in older people, this is our twin study, was uh, due to genetic factors. So I think this is something that most people do not uh, account for. And they think that all white matter lesions are, are uh, because of vascular risk and therefore preventable, which may not be true. Now, finally, I want to go to our post-stroke consortium, which is uh, uh, the stroke or consortium. Uh, this has uh, actually longitudinal studies post-stroke of cognitive impairment and decline, uh, decline. And we have 33 members, in fact now 34 members in this uh, study. And this is one of the uh, papers uh, published in Neurology in 2019, which looked at uh, over three and a half thousand uh, participants uh, two to six months after stroke. So roughly medium three months after stroke. And they found that we look at global cognition, about 44% had global impairment using 1.5 standard deviation as your cutoff for global cognition. In fact, but, uh, most, on most cognitive uh, domains, there was disturbance. Or in fact, all cognitive domains listed here, there was disturbance in the range of 30 to 35%. Uh, so, uh, so we would say that, I mean, this probably tallies well with maybe a 20, 25% risk uh, uh, of uh, prevalence of dementia in this group. So cognitive impairment after stroke is very common. And I think that's something that we should uh, remember. And when you looked at the risk factors for this, we found that past stroke was important, but diabetes. So if you had diabetes and also had a stroke, you were, uh, it was as bad as having had a previous stroke. Uh, and then there were other risk factors uh, such as uh, hypertension, uh, atrial fibrillation and smoking that were independent risk factors in addition to the stroke that they were important. And then we looked at decline in this group. Uh, and in fact, when you looked at the first year after stroke, you found that some people improved. The majority were about the same after three months uh, or three to six months is when the, they did the first assessment then did one assessment at one year. A small proportion declined in that period as well. So, uh, so mostly people after three months or so are reasonable after one year. They don't decline so much. Some improve, but, uh, and a few decline. But then we look at them beyond one year up to five years in some studies. We found that there was a gradual, very gradual decline. If you look at controls here on the right hand side, see that there was some decline. They started off quite low, as you can imagine, but then there was a gradual slow decline. So over several years, but if they had another stroke, then of course it was much greater decline. Now, I don't have time to actually go through the risk factors for vascular cognitive impairment. This has been published, I think the AHA 
ASC consensus, that 2018 paper, I refer you to that because that looked at the level of evidence for each of those risk factors. Uh, uh, and there was, there's another publication uh, I can probably, uh, these papers I can recommend, which actually looked at the risk factors for vascular dementia, post-stroke dementia, unspecified dementia, dementia, and, and Alzheimer's disease, and see, okay, which are the risk factors that are common to these different dementias? And that's very interesting, because we know, of course, age is a risk factor, but we look at some lifestyle factors, physical inactivity, having high BMI, they are risk factors for vascular dementia as well as for Alzheimer's disease. And similarly here, some of the vascular risk factors like midlife hypertension, diabetes, the risk factors for both uh, independently, I think, it, and it's not just, I think now reasonable evidence, not just a confound of uh, vascular dementia uh, uh, complicating Alzheimer's disease, but presence of concomitant vascular disease, a stroke also increased the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease. There's no association, no evidence for that. And we looked at markers of small vessel disease as well uh, in, in the brain. We did not find a, a relationship uh, with Alzheimer's, with PIB imaging, for example, in a study or with amyloid imaging in our twin study. Again, we did not see a relationship. So I'll finish with now with this study, which is actually something for the future, looking at biomarkers. Uh, and I think this is a complicated field because what, when we're looking at biomarkers, we want to look at uh, uh, what uh, the presence of cerebrovascular pathology, but then what, what pathology, because there are so many different kinds of pathologies in the brain. So we should we target. And then of course, sh uh, should we also look at parenchymal damage due to that cerebrovascular pathology? And this is why it has been complicated um, in trying to develop biomarkers. In fact, neuroimaging has been the best. And you will hear a lot about the advances in neuroimaging trying to actually put together cerebrovascular uh, uh, disease uh, burden in the brain. But then there are uh, measures looking at fluid biomarkers uh, and you can have biomarkers of blood brain barrier integrity. There's being work being done in there and markers of myelin damage. Then you can look at more non-specific like metabolic dysfunction or stress markers or neurofilament light, et cetera. But this, this is not something which is for the clinic. It is very much still in the research space. And then there is, of course, focus also on retinal biomarkers as retina being the eye to the brain uh, cerebrovasculature. So I think I might finish there. Uh, we are just I want to introduce our CRE, which is actually just beginning. And we're looking at revisiting the criteria. We're looking at the epidemiology, biomarkers. You know, so it's a broad, a very broad spoke and a number of partners from around the country who are contributing to this. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk. So I'm gonna focus more specifically on uh, imaging uh, in vascular cognitive disorder, um, which Paminda has already kind of set the scene for. Um, so broadly uh, in the time that I've got available, uh, it's really in three acts. Um, what we do at the moment, uh, the challenges and the problems, uh, I guess, with what we do at present, uh, and then looking at uh, some potential solutions to this, um, and finally uh, take home points and how you might be able to integrate some of what we've been saying into your clinical practice. Um, in terms of potential solutions, there's a, a lot of work out there and this will be a real whistle-stop tour of the field, but I'm going to be talking about um, different lesion types that we don't commonly look at, and then different ways of imaging, including diffusion tensor imaging, and then finally looking at different ways of kind of interrogating the data or putting together uh, different markers. So if it's not obvious, I might talk about actually why this matters. So the aim of the game, as Paminda was saying, with the various diagnostic criteria is really to show sufficient evidence that the cognitive impairment seen is due to vascular etiology. And the most common way we do that is really through neuroimaging and having accurate uh, estimates of cerebrovascular disease or burden can really help uh, make an accurate diagnosis. You know, the old dichotomy of either Alzheimer's or vascular dementia, I don't think holds true anymore. And we know there's a significant overlap and the presence of vascular disease in people with Alzheimer's uh, increases the risk and also um, has some deleterious effects on their progression. That having an estimate uh, an accurate estimate of uh, cerebrovascular disease burden can also estimate future risk, particularly in individuals who may be 
pre-symptomatic, which is important when we're looking at prevention. Um, we can monitor disease progression in an individual. And importantly, neuroimaging may be a viable and important biomarker that, as we know, in dementia trials, they're incredibly expensive and very long in duration. So if we can find an accurate biomarker, which uh, will really map the changes, that's going to be very useful. This is just a... Sorry, there was a car alarm going off outside. This is a... Uh, an interesting paper which looked at predicted sample size required comparing some of the common MRI measures with cognitive, cognitive indices in a hypothetical uh, scenario. And essentially what it suggests is you need much fewer participants uh, to give you the desired power using these MRI measures than the comparable cognitive measures. I'm gonna talk on imaging. Uh, but it's useful to consider why we're talking about imaging. So why aren't we looking at cognition, neuropathology, or some of these blood-based uh, or other fluid biomarkers? Well, cognition is obviously extremely valuable, but there's no pathognomonic deficit seen in VCD. The attention and processing speed in executives are most common, but depending on the area of, of the lesions, it can affect any cognitive domain. And then with neuropathology, um, or firstly, uh, getting neuropathological, neuropathological tissue in, in patients during their life isn't always practical, or generally isn't practical, um, but also there's no consensus on the neuropathological criteria, unlike with Alzheimer's. And then blood-based approaches uh, are very promising. Uh, Mark VIC is uh, an American consortium looking at this, but it's not ready for uh, the clinic at present. There's lots of challenges with uh, cerebrovascular disease quantification. There's lots of different lesion types, and we'll be talking about some of those common types, and they relate to one another, so they can become one another with time. And then in terms of the cognitive uh, outcome of those lesions, it can depend just not on their type, but also their size and location. And unlike large vessels, you can't directly visualize small vessels. And then the visualization of those lesions themselves is very dependent on technology and the field strength of the uh, MRI and so on. Lesions themselves may represent multiple pathologies and white matter hypertensities is a classic example of that. And again, there's no pathognomonic lesion of VCD. There's poor correlation between lesions and cognition, which we'll talk about in more detail. And then really determining what is the necessary threshold for a lesion to become pathological, given that some of these lesions are so common, almost ubiquitous in the aging brain. This is just describing some of the common uh, lesion types and their etiologies, but Pamin has already touched on this, so we'll just move on. This, um, so in an attempt to standardize, uh, sorry, in an attempt to standardize reporting of, in particular, the small vessel disease uh, lesions, the STRIVE criteria were developed uh, nearly a decade ago, um, outlining, defining, and recommending imaging parameters for the five most common types. So recent su uh, small subcortical infarct, what used to be called uh, lacuna infarcts, but they're trying to differentiate it from the lacoons, the chronic lacoons themselves white matter hyperintensities, which I'm sure most people know, but they can either be found uh, commonly in the perivascular or the deeper white regions. These indicate what sequence is best to visualize them. So white matter hyperintensities most easily seen on the flare sequence. And that's because the, uh, the signal from CSF is suppressed uh, and looks black on a flare sequence so that in particular these periventricular lesions can be seen more easily. Lacoons are also visualized best with flare and uh, commonly have this hyperintense rim around them. And that's important uh, when you're trying to differentiate them from dilated perivascular spaces. So dilated perivascular spaces, depending on your plane, uh, you'll either be cutting the vessel uh, in half or following the vessel. So they can either be linear or, or circular, but if they're circular lesions, they often don't have the hyperintense rim and they're generally smaller, but size isn't always an absolute criteria because you can get quite large perivascular spaces. Uh, and then finally, um, cerebral microbleeds. So uh, cerebral microbleeds are thought to be the site of old hemorrhages, 
uh, that hemosiderin deposits are left. And uh, this effect is magnified by certain sequences. So we use SWE, susceptibility weighted imaging, which magnifies that uh, effect. And, and you get what's known as a bit of a blooming artifact. And you can see these kind of punched out uh, lesions, cerebral microbleeds. Uh, as I said, um, they can evolve uh, into um, one another. This was from that same paper, the Strife Criteria from 2013. Um, and uh, if you look at the different colors here, the blue are the most common pathways, uh, green are next most common, and red are least common pathways. So um, we know with things like lacoons or white matter hypertensities, there can be no uh, obvious clinical um, signs preceding it, or some of these lesions can uh, evolve into one another. This slide is, is what we currently do, but um, actually getting a physicus rating is actually probably not a bad outcome. So um, there's considerable variability in the reporting of MRI scans around the country. Um, and that's one of the things that the, uh, the Adnet Memory Clinic guidelines is, is uh, attempting to um, address. Uh, but often, uh, personally speaking, for any given MRI report, it will just indicate maybe mild, moderate, or severe uh, small vessel disease or white matter changes suggestive of ischemic damage. Um, uh, but they generally don't uh, provide any rating scales. So there's lots of visual rating scales out there. I think the physique is it's the most commonly used probably and gives a rating between zero and four in uh, two different areas, periventricular and deep white matter. So you can see here, this is an example of a physicus level one, where there's this pencil lining uh, around the ventricles or what you could have caps up here. And then as the disease progress, you can see it becomes more uh, extensive and extends into the deep white matter. Equally, um, you can see just one kind of foci there, um, but obviously as the physicus uh, is getting worse, it's really expanding and becoming quite confluent uh, and extensive. So white matter hyperintensities, they're very common. Um, it's rare, frankly, to have an individual uh, who we see in clinic who doesn't have any white matter uh, pathology or white matter hyperintensities. In the Rotterdam study, um, where they looked at people aged 60 to 90, only 5% of people didn't have any uh, damage. The histopathology is, is complex and heterogeneous as well, which is why there's uh, not always the greatest clinical radiological correlations either. Now, importantly, extensive and confluent white matter hyperintensities on a kind of population or group level, it is associated with um, uh, incident dementia, and it is associated with cognitive impairment and indeed cognitive decline. The trouble is there's considerable variability between individuals. So for any given patient seeing you in clinic, it's very difficult to uh, make a, uh, a strong correlation or association between some of the deficits you're seeing on the MRI and, and, and the, the clinical picture. Um, there's been lots of uh, meta-analysis. This was from uh, the Debet group a few years ago. Um, looking at pooled hazard ratios. Uh, GP is the general population, HRP, and, and I hope you can see this, is high risk populations, they're at risk groups. But in both groups, the pooled estimate is clearly in favor of an increased risk of incident dementia. And I should say these are um, extensive white matter hyperintensities, however it's defined. There's not a great correlation between visual ratings and uh, volumetrics. Uh, so you can see here physique is one, two, and three, and there's really very considerable overlap. And, and this is an important slide. This is uh, unpublished data from our own group, but I just wanted to demonstrate, as I said, that poor correlation between uh, white matter volume, so more accurate than physique and cognition. So we've got volume on the x-axis, on the y-axis, We've got global cognition and then attention and processing speed, as I said, a domain commonly affected by vascular cognitive disorders. 
And if you look at the linear regression, um, the, the p-value, there is no uh, overall association. And in fact, although it's only a few individuals, if you can see these thin, uh, these light gray circles, it shows that actually there's some individuals with very significant white matter disease, um, but their Z score is fairly close to zero. So they're really not that impaired. Um, in contrast, if you look to the very uh, left of the graph, you see people with barely any uh, white matter disease and there's considerable variation in their cognitive scores. This, uh, these are the various uh, neuroimaging requirements of some of those diagnostic criteria that Perminder was talking about, although I haven't included uh, the most recent VICs. Um, uh, I'm not going to read this uh, in detail, but uh, I've put it up there to highlight a few things. One, there's disagreement in the field uh, about what the threshold for these vascular lesions should be, although there is, I guess, we are, we are getting some agreement. Um, but uh, um, certainly the VASCOG criteria I find helpful in my clinical practice as it's the most uh, detailed, but then there's still kind of um, wiggle room or, or room to operationalize that. So extensive and confident white matter lesions, for example, um, uh, are used as evidence of significant evidence of cerebrovascular disease, but how exactly you define that is still not entirely clear whether it's physicus or volumes or other systems. So now we'll move on uh, to think about potential solutions. So cerebral microbleeds, um, we looked at their relationship, uh, not just to cross-sectional, but to longitudinal cognitive impairment and incident dementia over four years. Uh, we looked at linear mixed modeling. Um, there's two groups of figures here. On this side, we're looking at uh, individuals with no microbleeds versus microbleeds present. So that's one or more. Uh, these figures, we're looking at individuals with no microbleeds versus those with multiple microbleeds. So that's two or more. Because evidence has suggested that actually the significance of just having one solitary microbleed isn't that great as actually uh, it can get a kind of a bit mixed up in rating and it could be rated erroneously either way. But there was an association with global cognition. There was just an association with one cognitive domain, visuospatial function, which we found hard to explain. And on this side, uh, there was an association with executive function, but actually it was going in, in, in the opposite direction. Um, we think caused by a particularly um, poor result in baseline at those with multiple microbleeds. Um, Meta-analyses have suggested that there may be a, uh, an impact on multiple microbleeds. Again, that's two or more. Uh, when they were looking at just uh, one or more microbleeds, it wasn't significant. And again, whether there was an impact on regional microbleeds. So you can divide them into loba or deep and or mixed microbleeds, and they're supposed to be associated with different pathologies, that loba microbleeds are more associated with CAA, uh, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and deep microbleeds are more associated with kind of the hypertensive type fast aging related vasculopathy. And in this, uh, there was uh, an association. But I guess from my research, microbleeds uh, have not been the most impressive marker. There's renewed interest or increasing interest in perivascular spaces, which were once thought to be just an incidental finding. Uh, they're commonly found in the basal ganglia and centrum semi-ovale, uh, have to be visually rated at the moment, which is uh, a challenge. Um, it, more easily seen on T2 sequences when they're hyper intense, when they're bright. We unfortunately with our studies didn't have those scans, and so we developed a rating scale looking, uh, looking at T1 weighted scans and had two representative slices rather than looking at the, the whole brain, so one of the basal ganglia one of the centrum semi ovale. Um, we found, uh, if we're looking at the association of those with severe basal ganglia perivascular space, so it's di dichotomized around the top quartile, the top 25%, and then looking at uh, those with severe centrum semi ovale perivascular space pathology, the only significant association was in global cognition. So when we looked at the individual cognitive domains, uh, there wasn't an association with cognitive decline, including these two, which again are most commonly thought to be associated with VCD. Um, 
it's worth saying that that remains significant even in model two when it was adjusted for the presence of some of these other small vessel disease markers. Then we looked at the probability of developing dementia and uh, we had a longer follow-up period for this, so we had up to eight years. Uh, what's most apparent in uh, this figure is the high rates of dementia on this black line. The black line are those individuals with both severe basal ganglia and severe uh, centrum semi-ovale uh, pathology. So that was seven percent of the groups, so about 32 individuals uh, had this picture and they had much higher rates uh, of developing dementia compared to their correspondents who didn't have pathology in either region. But what we see really looking at this picture as a whole is there's higher rates of developing dementia mid-study at kind of year four to six. No effect at year two. And by year eight, interesting, there were no statistical differences. And we think that's probably by year eight, you can see the sharp uptake in the probability of developing dementia generally, which we think probably masks the signal from perivascular spaces. Uh, Moving on to different uh, techniques now, I want to talk uh, about diffusion tensor imaging. And just a recap for maybe people who aren't that familiar with the field is that um, in a normal kind of free water, there's a random 3D pattern of diffusion just by Brownian motion. Uh, and we call that isotropic. But uh, once water is in uh, tissues like the axons here, Obviously, it's restricted in the way that it can diffuse, and we call that anisotropy, anisotropic. Um, and that can be modeled various ways, but including by this tensor, which is a, a mathematical concept with eigenvalues. Um, and so a circle uh, sphere looks like that, or this would have a high FA, this elliptoid. Um, and with DTI data, you can do nice things like this tractography and map out individual tracks within the brain. Uh, but it can also be used. Um, uh, in our area of interest in particular because it's known that uh, even in normal appearing white matter you get DTI parameter alteration so essentially DTI can pick up damage earlier than can be seen on just structural measures um, and then this has been operationalized various ways but PSMD peak skeletonized mean diffusivity was a measure developed a few years ago where you get the, the, the skeletonized white matter tracks of the brain, and then you look at the mean diffusivity in each of those areas and plot it on a histogram. And PSMD is the difference between the fifth and the 95th centile. So a larger PSMD will be associated with a greater variance of, of mean diffusivity and a greater degree of damage. And then um, in the original paper, they validated a number of uh, cohorts, including patients with Cadacil, a genetic small vessel disease, um, but also sporadic small vessel disease and just in a, in a memory clinic. And you can see really in all those different cohorts, uh, it was associated. These figures below uh, look at the R squared, the proportion of variance explained. And in all cases, PSMD performed better than some of these other measures, lots of acronyms, but microbleeds, uh, normalized white matter, volume, uh, lacoon volume, and brain parental fraction. Um, finally, uh, people, including our group, are looking at developing indices where we put together several different measures, which will hopefully be more informative just in a single measure. This is the most commonly used scale at the moment, the Stahl scale, where um, individuals can just get uh, between zero and four points, depending on the presence of each of these common uh, small vessel disease markers that we've spoken about, and it's just binary one or zero for each of them. So, I mean, the beauty of that, it's very easy to do. It's very quick, um, easy to use in the bedside, but obviously you, you lose a lot of information. So we're looking at developing a more sophisticated scale. Um, and then in the last few minutes, just to say that there's also regional based approaches. So groups, including our own, are mapping white matter, damage lesions onto individual tracks. And that gives you the possibility to really interrogate lots of um, uh, lots of useful information. So looking at if there's specific patterns of cognitive impairment or cognitive domains, depending on which tract is impaired. Um, but certainly early uh, results seems to suggest that looking at the specific tracks uh, can be more informative than looking at global measures of 
white matter disease. Um, so in summary, there are existing methods, but they're fairly coarse and really better methodologies are needed to reap the potential benefits of this area. In terms of take home points, we know that there's significant variability in even access to CT and MRI around the country, particularly MRI. And then there's significant variability in the reporting of that. Some uh, centers have specific dementia protocols, others it's a more kind of ad hoc basis. Um, neuroimaging rarely makes the diagnosis in isolation. So please consider the whole clinical picture, but speak to your radiology departments, ask maybe if they can do physicus or some of these other important non-vascular rating scales such as global cortical atrophy. Um, view images directly. Uh, you may not always uh, agree with how it's being rated. Um, and then I guess the possibility of white matter hypertensity, white matter hypertensity volumetrics is coming online. And I've just mentioned automation is coming. So for each of those lesion types that I've discussed, um, there's uh, a lot of work going to automating the process to make it less onerous to rate. Um, and I'll leave it there. So I think it was very good that Minda already started answering some questions in the chat and in the QA. So um, if you put a question in the QA already, take a look at the answer to a tap and your question might already been answered in there. Um, the one question that hasn't been answered uh, yet was, um, is there a particular pattern in vascular changes found in different diseases, whether in in, in affected infarct type, brain regions, laminar layer, or pace of progression? Yeah, no, that's it's a, a difficult question. I was going to, I started answering, but then I didn't know how to answer it, I guess. <laughs> uh, there is, uh, I think what happens uh, uh, is that uh, certainly someone who presents with a hemorrhage is different, uh, say, from someone who has ischemic change, uh, definitely a hemorrhage. There's often a reason there is a burst, uh, say, aneurysm, for example, or someone has amyloid angiopathy or some, some, some other uh, lesion, say, uh, uh, vascular malformation. Their pattern is going to be very different. Although hemorrhage does cause a fair degree of uh, brain damage and uh, cognitive impairment, but uh, the, the pattern is going to be very different. Someone who presents with a stroke, for example, but with a stroke, often what happens, of course, the cause of stroke is important. Is it because of uh, uh, thrombosis? Is it because of embolism? Uh, so each that will determine, okay, what where the stroke is and what uh, size the stroke might be, et cetera. But often you find that patients who present with strokes usually don't have uh, uh, just uh, that uh, damage restricted to that particular stroke. Uh, often they carry a lot of damage prior to them having had a stroke. So we see, see a lot of white matter hyperintensities in stroke patients, so even though this may be their first presentation with stroke. And the other thing, of course, we also see is that many people who have no history of stroke or TIAs have significant uh, degree of, say, lacoons in their brains, microbleeds in their brains, sometimes infarct, large infarcts in their brains, which is silent. So the presentation is so varied in that sense. Uh, and one would have to look at the overall picture. And also, of course, then you have to regard certain specific diseases that have uh, uh, particular, there are a few uncommon genetic diseases, for example, like Cadicel, which presents with uh, a certain pattern uh, as well. So it's a very complex question with many different answers, I would say. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, if people are still there and uh, able to join a few minutes longer, we might just come to a few more questions. Um, one question was around, um, what would you tell a patient who is amyloid PET positive? Um, the MRI shows significant white matter lesions, but there's no history of discrete events. So what would you actually yeah. tell the patient? I think Faminda started answering that. Yeah, yeah. So I think Michael, Michael Woodward asked that. That's a, that's a good question. And it's, uh, uh, he, he's not satisfied with my answer, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, which I can expect because I, uh, uh, I, firstly, I would say that, yes, white matter lesions are not always ischemic, uh, small vessel disease lesions, really. There are, uh, because what we're seeing is just hyperintensities on MRI, and we are inferring from that that this is because of ischemic change uh, in, in the white matter. But it may be inflammation that produces that signal, or it may be demyelination from other causes. Uh, so uh, I think that's that's one thing. So it's, we are really what we are saying is that majority of what you see in older people, 
is because of ischemic damage. And there are several reasons why we say that in terms of uh, uh, observations, associations, also some neuropathological models, uh, animal models. So various pointing to that, yes, largely ischemic, but they're not specific to ischemia, that's one. The other thing, and I think maybe what Michael uh, is referring to is that yes, in Alzheimer's disease, especially uh, even, even in patients with early onset Alzheimer's disease, we see a fair bit of white matter lesions. And we see extreme white matter lesions in frontotemporal dementia patients as well, who are also, also young, they don't have a lot of vascular pathology, and yet we see these white matter lesions. So I think we have to accept that these are not specific uh, to vascular pathology. But it, when I see someone with Alzheimer's disease and I see a lot of white matter lesions, I do not know precisely how much it, it is due to uh, Alzheimer's pathology and how much is it due to vascular pathology in the brain. Uh, and unless I have other measures, if I have, say, lacoons, I have, uh, uh, say, infarcts uh, in their brains, uh, that I uh, would not be able to say. And then I, what I say is, look, the best thing we can do in your case is look at your risk, vascular risk. And, and, uh, and that has that is got two purposes. Firstly, of course, vascular risk will increase cerebrovascular disease, but vascular, many vascular risk factors are also risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, as we said, midlife hypertension, diabetes. So we try to reduce your vascular risk as best as we can with the identifiable. And that's the best we can do in the clinic with, with uh, these unknowns. And I hope that is something that Michael is happy with. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, one other question um, that was asked for clinical practical impl implications in memory clinics, for example. Um, so what should be the minimum neuroimaging advice so that is mostly computer tomography still used? Um, and what are implications for the management of people with vascular dementia? Pat, you want to take that? Uh, I can take so in the first part. I think it's a much debated issue. Um, frankly, what the minimum imaging requirements are. Um, Inga, I wasn't there for that part of the Delphi process for the ADNET guidelines, but I, I gather there was considerable debate. I think the VIX uh, have recommended that MRI, or there's a general consensus towards MRI being the gold standard, and certainly, and Paminda can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, for a diagnosis of probable vascular dementia or VCD, that MRI evidence is needed. Um, but for many people, it's just not available and CT is, is all you've got. So I said, you know, I think CT is better than nothing, but where possible, I'm, I'm a big proponent of MRI. Yeah, I, I strongly favor using MRI, I think, uh, because the, the picture it gives of the brain in terms of the extent of the disease, especially vascular disease. Uh, and also, if you look, want to look at vol volumetrics, if you want to be guided by that, uh, to some extent, I think it's much greater. And I think it's worthy, worth spending. Uh, I mean, it's not a lot of more, more money. If you're doing a CT brain with contrast, uh, you really uh, creeping up in terms of your cost vis-a-vis uh, -vis an MRI scan. So I don't think you save much. You certainly do not give radiation exposure, which uh, you know, may or may not be that critical, but uh, I certainly would favor MRI. Very much. And maybe one last question um, that was regarding Matt's presentation. In the BG changes, have you correlated PET tau and Lewy body PET in those areas? Sorry, in the what changes? It says in the BG changes, and I think um, I need to refer basal back ganglion. to basal ganglion. Basal ganglion, yeah. Ganglion, yeah. thank you. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if the, the, the question is responding, uh, is asking about um, uh, the microbleeds, or I presume it's the perivascular spaces, but no, we none of our work has looked at uh, currently at, at the correlation with uh, pet imaging. Um, yeah, my suspicion is, yeah, my suspicion is you won't see much of a relationship with, with the basal ganglia perivascular spaces. And uh, so it's only perivascular spaces you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, not, uh, not microbleeds you're really looking at cortex and the white matter really yeah and, and it's thought that that same uh, kind of association with pathology exists for perivascular spaces whereas the kind of the ones in the basal ganglia may be more associated with that kind of hypertensive vasculopathy yeah. whereas the yeah. ones higher in the brain again it may be more amyloid related but there is certainly an association between perivascular space and, and alzheimer's yeah Okay, thank you very much. There's two more questions that just 
popped up. Um, just given the time, I think we might call it to a close for today. Um, so apologies if you couldn't answer the questions. You can still reach the speakers um, and the team, and we're happy to forward any forward any outstanding questions. Um, there will be, thank you very much for joining um, this presentation and thank you very much for the speakers for making such a great presentation today. Um, there will be a survey at the end of this for everyone who stayed um, and everyone. Um, so if you feel like you want to give us any feedback on how the webinar uh, is going, how you think, um, what we can improve, if you have any suggestions of topics, you can do that afterwards. Um, and we will have our next webinar in April, uh, and that will most likely be about dementia in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So uh, watch this space and uh, um, yeah, you will receive an email on um, registrations for the next webinar. Um, and also I'd like to remind you that our memory clinics guideline, which Matt mentioned earlier, is out now. So please go to the Etna Memory Clinics website um, and download it if you haven't done that already. Um, all right, thank you very much for joining today and um, we're looking forward to see you again in the next webinar in April.